Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast brought to you by the Monarch Joint Venture and the Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center. My name is Tracy McLeaf, and I'm a biologist at NCTC and work with MJV to bring this series to you. So now, please enjoy as Dr. Karen Oberhauser, professor in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology and co-chair of the Monarch Joint Venture Steering Committee, introduces today's presenters and topic. Karen? Thanks, Tracy. And hi, everyone. We're really happy that you're joining us today. Like Tracy said, I'm Karen Oberhauser. I'm the um, Steering Committee co-chair of the Monarch Joint Venture. And I'm also joined by Shelby, who's the MJV Communications Specialist. We're excited to bring you today's webinar about the assessment of exotic milkweed and the spread of disease in monarchs. This is the 11th in a series of monarch webinars with topics ranging from basic monarch biology, practical methods for creating monarch habitat, to the nitty-gritty details of state-of-the-art science. All of our previous webinars are available online at the Monarch Joint Venture and NCTC websites. Today's presenters include Sonia Altheiser, Anya Majewska, and Dara Satterfield, all from the Odom School of Ecology at the University of Georgia. I'll introduce Sonia first. Sonia is a professor and associate dean of academic affairs and has been studying monarchs for over 20 years. Her research interests center on insect ecology and evolution and on infectious disease ecology and its interface with animal behavior and anthropogenic change. Much of her recent work focuses on interactions between monarch butterflies and a protozoan path parasite to better understand the consequences of long distance migration for animal pathogen interactions. And hopefully by the end of today's webinar, you'll all be able to say and spell Ophriocystis electroscura. Sonia also collaborates on studies testing how factors such as seasonality and contact behavior influence the dynamics of pathogens affecting birds, bats, and primates. Starting in 2006, her lab has coordinated the Monarch Health Citizen Science Project. This project involves North American volunteers in sampling wild monarchs for a debilitating parasite. And Dara and Anya are two of Sonia's graduate students. And we'll move to Dara first, because she'll be talking to you first. For the past five years, Dara has focused on monarchs in coastal areas of the southern United States where some butterflies skip the migration and breed year-round. She works with citizen scientists and other monarch experts, experts to monitor wild monarchs for parasites and to understand how to improve monarch habitat. Anya, in the middle, has strong interest in pollinator conservation and disease ecology, and her PhD research examines the effects of gardens on butterflies with a focus on tropical milkweed and monarchs. And I just want to point out that it's a real special pleasure for me to host this webinar since Sonia was my very first graduate student. Um, she's had a distinguished academic career since she left Minnesota, and it's been a lot of fun for me to meet the students that she's been mentoring. Um, these students are just as amazing as she was. And um, for those of you who aren't professors, we often talk about our academic lineages so it's really a lot of fun for me to introduce Anya and Dara, who are sort of like my grand students, and they really are grand. Um, so we'll start now. Um, just to point out if any questions come up during the presentations, Shelby's going to be monitoring the chat box, where we encourage you to enter questions that you have. You won't be able to speak them directly to us. We'll have a question and answer period at the end of the webinar where I'll pose the um, questions to our three experts. So I'm going to turn it over to Sonia, and feel free to get started whenever you're ready. Thank you, Karen, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And I want to thank uh, Monarch Joint Venture for giving us the platform to present today. As Karen noted, I'm Sonia Altizer. I've been studying monarchs and their interactions with disease for many years. And I'll kick things off today before turning things over to Dara and Anya. And I'd like to begin by painting a visual picture for you of two contrasting places. So first, let's imagine a field of common milkweed that dominates monarch breeding habitats in the northern US and Canada. So here you're looking at a vast milkweed field that might be in a pasture or another open habitat with hundreds of 
if not thousands, of milkweed plants spaced apart. And during the summer, we'd have monarchs flying through this field and males patrolling in search of females and females flying from plant to plant looking for places to lay their tiny pearl-colored eggs. And so in a field like this, at peak monarch abundance in July, we might turn over stalks of milkweed and find eggs, about one egg for every 30 to 50 plants. And rarely, we might see two or three eggs per plant, but this would be a very low density of monarch eggs and caterpillars. And we'd also see a low infection rate by the protozoan OE, which we'll hear about later today, uh, occasional predation and infection by parasitoids like tachinid flies. And this habitat would be highly seasonal. So by August, most of the plants will have set seed and will be dying back for the year. So contrast this, then, with a garden of tropical milkweed in the southern U.S., like this one from Atlanta. And here you've, you see the tropical milkweed that's planted in a dense cluster, and perhaps within the, in the same county there might be a dozen or two dozen other gardens at schools and backyards with the milkweed clumped into patches. And when female monarchs find a patch like this, they'll stick around for a while and lay lots of eggs, so we might find up to 20 eggs per plant. And at, at times, we might see five or 10 caterpillars on a single milkweed stalk. So this is a very high density of caterpillars, which is different from what we might see in common milkweed um, habitats further north. And depending on where this is, the plants would keep re-sprouting and stay in leaf and flower until if and when they're hit by a hard frost. So this is a much less seasonal habitat than the native common milkweed. And in these tropical milkweed gardens, we might also see high infection rates by the protozoan OE. We might see evidence of starvation because oftentimes caterpillars eat the milkweed all the way to the ground. So at the far left is a, is a monarch caterpillar that's run out of food. We might see evidence of high attack rates by parasitoids, which is shown in the middle part of this uh, slide where there, it's hard to see, but this, this um, caterpillar in the J has been attacked by a tachinid fly. And then a lot of the adults might look um, slightly have, de have wing deformities or look like they have failure to thrive. So, um, and that is indicative of infection by the protozoan OE. So the plants look pretty, but sometimes the monarchs in these patches do not. So in my lab, we've been studying interactions between monarchs and tropical milkweed for the past several years. And today we want to tell you about some issues with tropical milkweed that we've been looking at, including um, the fact, you know, how it behaves differently in terms of its phenology, or which is another word for the timing of, of life events and seasonality, um, its effects on monarch disease, its potential impacts on monarch migrations, and then what that means for monarch conservation and recommendations for habitat management and things that concerned citizens can do to help monarchs. So to give you a little bit of background, again, on tropical milkweed, most of you are probably familiar with this plant. It's a, actually a very beautiful plant. You might have planted it in your garden at some point. I know I've planted it in my garden at, in the past. And this plant is also known as Asclepius curasavica, blood flower, Mexican milkweed, and scarlet milkweed. So these are all names for the same thing. And these milkweeds have smooth leaves and bright red and orange flowers. In terms of the history of tro tropical milkweed and its distribution, this map on the left is adapted from a monograph by a scientist named Woodson that was published in 1954. And it shows the circled ranges of many of the approximately 100 or so species of milkweeds that are native to North America. So these are not tropical milkweeds. So all of the blobs here would be the range of a different milkweed species. And it, it really just gives you the uh, impression or the visual image of how many na milkweeds are native to North America. And that some of them have very big ranges and some of them have restricted ranges. But we have a wide diversity of milkweeds here in the US and Canada. Tropical milkweed, shown here on the right, is um, in fact native to the neotropics, so Central and South America. And the range is a little bit bigger than what's shown on the map because it also inhabits much of Mexico and the Caribbean. And it's also, for at least for as long as we know, has been in the extreme south of Texas and extreme southern Florida. So Woodson actually didn't say much about tropical milkweed in his monograph, except to note that its geographic origin is not 100% clear. And he um, kind of referred to it as a renegade 
milkweed. So he didn't think that it was he didn't he didn't really think very highly of tropical milkweed, um, except that it was just sort of a a, um, um, a lesser of the milkweeds because it wasn't he didn't view it as being native to North America. In the tropics, this tropical milkweed is also a weedy plant. It grows on roadsides and cow pastures, much like the common milkweed would grow here in Canada and the U.S. Now, tropical milkweed has been widely introduced around the world, including in the U.S., going back as early as the 1800s. So on the left are images from a garden magazine from the 1840s that talks about how to cultivate different garden plants, including how to grow tropical milkweed. So we know it's been planted here in the U.S. for a long time, but we think that its occurrence and abundance has increased in recent decades, in part because people are more and more aware of monarchs and their need for milkweed. Um, and, and so they, they want to find milkweed and plant it um, in their yards to help out monarchs. So this graph on the right shows references to tropical milkweed in herbarium records. So herbaria are like plant museums in the U.S. going back to the early 1900s, so the number of records per year. And there are clearly many more records per year of tropical milkweed in the most recent two decades since 2003 than in previous decades. So we think that it's, um, it's becoming more common. Now, I often refer to uh, Curasavica as Home Depot milkweed, because if you go to garden centers like Home Depot or Lowe's, if they have any milkweed at all, it's usually tropical milkweed. So this is a tray of silky deep red milkweed which is being sold at Home Depot. So this is just a variety of trop tropical milkweed. And it's so readily available that people are planting it all over North America. And this map on the right was made from volunteer observations associated with the Project Journey North. And this just shows locations where people have reported, self-reported planting tropical milkweed. So Andy Davis, um, who's my husband, and he's a faculty at UGA, and an undergraduate student combed through the records of the Citizen Science Project Journey North, where people report their first monarch that they cite each year. And they, they combed the records for any reference to curasavica or tropical milkweed that volunteers had self-reported. And they mapped where people were growing that plant. And this is just from the past five years of citing. And it's very likely incomplete. But it gives you a picture that tropical milkweed is now being planted widely across the continent with clusters, um, possibly with clusters in the Northeast and in Texas and in Florida. Now, tropical milkweed has some traits that differ from many of our native milkweeds. And one of it's, so first of all, it's one of the more toxic milkweed species in terms of, of, of um, toxins we call cardenolides. So you might know that monarchs are toxic to many predators, and they get their toxins from the plants they eat. And some milkweeds, like swamp milkweed shown on the left here, have um, little or no toxins, and some milkweeds have a lot of toxins and, and very concentrated toxins. And these toxins make monarchs distasteful to predators. So this is an image on the left of a blue jay eating a monarch, and then a few minutes later vomiting it back up, and it will never go near another orange butterfly again. And the toxins in the milkweeds that the monarchs concentrate in their own bodies are car called cardiac glycosides or cardenolides, and these are carbon ring steroid-like compounds, so if you're into organic chemistry, there's a, um, a diagram of cardenolides shown on this slide. And these uh, cause heart palpitations and cardiac arrest in vertebrates. They have a bitter taste, and they actually shut down the sodium-potassium pump um, in, in heart muscle. They can also cause strong allergic reactions in people. I know this firsthand from getting uh, tropical milkweed sap in my eye. I highly discourage any of you from doing that. And tropical milkweed has a very high concentration of cardenolides and a high diversity of cardenolides that make it especially toxic. And these same compounds act as attractants to monarchs in terms of egg laying activity. Um, the monarchs can deal with the toxins fairly well, and they like to lay eggs on plants that have a high concentration of toxins. Now, tropical milkweed. So it's, it's, a to, it's one of the most toxic milkweeds, and it also differs from a lot of native milkweeds because it lacks seasonality. So we um, say that tropical milkweed differs in phenology, which is the seasonal timing of life events. So our native milkweeds, like the common milkweed shown on the left, set flower in spring or summer, and they set seed by late summer or fall, and then they die back. And usually you don't see the flowers anymore when the seed pods are mature, such as um, you see in this picture. Now, tropical milkweeds behave more as tropical plants, 
so they can actually have flowers and mature seeds at the same time. And in parts of the U.S. with mild fall and winter climates, um, these tropical milkweeds can persist long into the winter and even year-round and keep producing new leaves and flowers during the time when monarchs are migrating and into the winter months. In mild years with delayed frost, people have even reported seeing tropical milkweed flowering as far north as Philadelphia around Thanksgiving. And in this slide, you see pictures taken from Cape May, New Jersey in October last year. On the left is common milkweed in someone's garden which has died back during the time when the monarchs are migrating through down the east coast. But across the street, there's um, tropical milkweed planted which is still in leaf and flower and has monarch eggs and caterpillars on it. So this milkweed is available to monarchs at a time of year when other milkweeds are not. And it will stay available, fostering monarch reproduction until it's hit by a hard frost, as shown in the image on the right here with all the dead, it's hard to see, but all the dead brown stalks are recently frozen tropical milkweed in an Atlantic Coast garden. So now that I've introduced you to the biology of tropical milkweed, I'm going to turn things over to Dara Satterfield, who's going to tell you more about how tropical milkweed affects monarch ecology and disease. Thank you, Sonia. So as we just discussed, tropical milkweed can grow really late into the winter and even year-round in some areas. And as long as tropical milkweed is available, monarchs will, monarchs will breed on it, whether or not they're following their tradition, traditional migratory cycle. For example, this caterpillar was um, taken, this picture was taken in Savannah, Georgia in January of 2014. And you wouldn't normally expect caterpillars and monarchs to be breeding. And so this winter breeding became especially clear in 2010 when Elizabeth Howard and her colleagues reported Journey North data showing that monarchs were breeding. They were producing eggs, larvae, and, and pupae in the winter in December and January. And you can see that occurring primarily along the Gulf Coast and the Southern Atlantic Coast in these green dots in this graph. And this, these are data produced by citizen scientists. And these findings are especially interesting because of course the winter is when we think of monarchs as roosting in Mexico, as postponing their reproduction until the spring and clustering in the oil and fir trees. But we now have this contrasting situation of while most monarchs are still migratory, some portion of the population is now breeding in the southern US during the winter. And there, there are a handful of anecdotal reports of this kind of winter breeding of monarchs in the southern U.S. in the 1950s by Fred Urquhart. But this report in 2010 from Elizabeth Howard was the first time that we thought winter breeding might be widespread. And we thought that this is also distinct from what's happening in South Florida, where there's long been a monarch population that's been non-migratory. You may have noticed winter breeding in your yard before, especially if you live in the south uh, or somewhere in your area. And if you have, you know that it can be pretty unsettling to see in some cases. Um, for example, at this garden in Houston in 2014, um, late in the, in the fall, you can see naked milkweed stalks of tropical milkweed that have been completely defoliated by really dense caterpillars. And um, in this same garden, it was so dense, the monarchs were so dense and had eaten all the food that I found uh, multiple fifth end stars crawling on the ground, searching desperately for leaves to eat. In that same garden, there were a few leaves left on one stalk, and there were 11 caterpillars competing for the food. So we know that there is probably a starvation risk associated with these tropical milkweed gardens that grow year round. At the same time, we're concerned about a freezing risk for these sites in the southern U.S when there are random freezes or unexpected freezes in the winter. Um, the tropical milkweed leaves often don't live, um, even if their, root, their roots survive. And so then, um, like this garden in Savannah, Georgia, the caterpillars often die, um, like this one, that froze to death. Um, and I remember finding dead caterpillars on the ground in a similar garden in, in Savannah this winter when we had some hard freezes. So we think that there's a freezing risk associated with these tropical milkweed gardens as well. People also started to see something else in these winter breeding locations in the 2000s. Not only was there a freezing risk and a starvation risk, but people started reporting sick butterflies. Dr. Altizer received emails from people along the Gulf Coast saying that they had sick butterflies in their yard in the winter, and they often had crumpled wings like this one. 
And this sounded an awful lot to us, like symptoms or signs of disease from Ophriocystis electrospira, or OE for short. And this is a protozoan parasite that specializes on monarchs, and we study this parasite in our lab. And it's probably co-evolved with monarchs for a long time, um, and we know that if it, and a monarch is infected with this protozoan, they'll be covered by millions of dormant spores on the outside of their bodies that are microscopic. Transmission occurs when an infected adult butterfly visits a milkweed plant, deposits some spores, and then a caterpillar then consumes those spores. So transmission is always going to occur from adult to larva, and that's really the only way a new infection can start. Adults can passively transfer spores to each other, for example, through mating, but it won't start a new infection until a caterpillar consumes the parasite. The parasites replicate inside the chrysalis once they're consumed, and you can see the dark patches under this chrysalis. Those are spores that are forming. And sometimes they, they form so excessively that a monarch won't be able to emerge properly from its chrysalis and might get stuck and die during this stage. In other cases, monarchs look completely healthy, like this one, um, but they may not fly as well or live as long as healthy butterflies. They'll experience slower flight speeds and um, often smaller body size and some consequences for mating. So we know this is a serious disease for monarchs, and once a monarch is infected, that there is no cure. So once Dr. Altizer received some of these reports, we began to wonder, is this a widespread problem? Are monarchs experiencing higher levels of OE prevalence in the winter breeding areas across the southeast and south central US. And so we started a project to ask this question and to work with citizen scientists and do a comparative study, um, studying the monarchs in the pink areas, they are migratory in the summer breeding sites and in Mexico, and contrasting that, that with these sedentary monarchs in the green areas. We worked with over 100 citizen scientists to complete this project, and all of these dots on these maps show uh, locations where citizen scientists helped us collect these data, testing wild butterflies for disease. All of this was done through our citizen science program, Monarch Health, um, which Sonia Altizer started in 2006. And this program, just to give you a little bit of background, is where people are testing wild butterflies for disease with this um, tape that you can just press against the monarch's abdomen to collect some scales and um, parasite spores if they're there. And then people send the cards to our lab for analysis. If you're interested in learning more about this project, you can visit monarchparasites.org. So when we did this project and worked with um, over 100 people, we sampled about 6,000 butterflies. And the results were striking. If you look at this graph showing the proportion of infected butterflies across these regions, um, we can see that the winter breeding monarchs experienced OE prevalence that was five times higher than what migratory monarchs experience when they're in Mexico or in their summer breeding range. And so this was a really striking result and one that we were concerned about. And we saw this two years in a row. For the same study, we distributed site surveys to our volunteers to ask them, at these winter breeding sites where you're seeing high levels of disease, what kind of site do you have? What kind of garden is it? And in every single case, um, our volunteers told us it was tropical milkweed that the monarchs were using during the winter and getting sick on. And there were no exceptions for our study. It was always tropical milkweed. And to, to back up and to think about why were we seeing these high levels of disease in the winter breeding sites, um, in the South, we, we first have to discuss a little bit about Dr. Altizer's previous work in her lab. And um, she's shown in the past that migration actually helps to reduce infection levels for monarchs every year. So if you can imagine migratory monarchs going to Mexico, um, they're leaving in the fall and they're leaving behind contaminated milkweed that has parasite spores on it likely. And, and um, they're able to leave this behind and benefit from that break in transmission for part of the year. And this is called migratory escape. And at the same time, in their 2000, on their 2,000-mile journey, um, it's a strenuous trek for these monarchs, and a lot of the infected butterflies don't survive. So infected monarchs can be weeded out of the population, and this is called migratory culling. And so through these two mechanisms, migratory monarchs actually benefit by experiencing lower levels of OE after they travel to Mexico. 
So we end up seeing that migration reduces disease for monarchs annually. It's something that keeps their population healthy. Unfortunately for the winter breeding monarchs in the southern U.S., they are not having these benefits of migratory culling and migratory escape. And we think that's what's creating these high levels of disease. We begin to hear similar reports, actually, of winter, brown, winter, winter um, breeding in California. And we started another project to ask this uh, similar question, but on the western part of the country. At these winter breeding sites in California, are monarchs experiencing higher levels of OE compared to migratory monarchs there? And we were curious about what we would find because we know that in, in the West, uh, monarchs have a little bit of a different life cycle where they're still migrating but going a shorter distance. And we wondered if we would find the same thing. Um, so we worked with um, 36 volunteers and sampled about 3,500 monarchs um, at both overwintering sites in green and the blue sites um, that are the winter breeding sites. And this time we found a pattern that was even more surprising. Um, we, we see here in this graph the percentage of infected butterflies at the year-round breeding sites versus the overwintering sites. And this time um, we see that winter breeding monarchs in California were nine times more likely to get OE compared to migratory butterflies. So we know that th this is a real concern for butterflies um, that are breeding year-round. They're experiencing very high levels of infection prevalence and very high levels of infection risk. But some of this might be surprising um, to hear if you've heard that tropical milkweed actually has medicinal properties as well that helps protect monarchs to some degree against OE. And indeed, in Yopterota's lab at Emory, they have shown that tropical milkweed can help butterflies that are infected with OE um, to some degree, and they can get lower spore loads and longer lifespan if they're fighting this disease and they've eaten tropical milkweed as a caterpillar. And to give you a little bit more information about one of the studies they did in his lab, in this graph you can see um, an experiment in Yopterida's lab where they infected butterflies in their lab with different parasites uh, that are called parasite clones on the bottom. All of these are OE strains. And they then looked at monarch lifespan, um, which is shown on the y-axis there. And you can see that the monarchs that were fed tropical milkweed, the dark red bars, lived a longer lifespan than the monarchs that were fed a native milkweed when they were fighting this parasite. And so that seems like a good thing. And it, and it indeed is if you're an individual butterfly that are, that's having to fight against this disease. But we're concerned about what this means for the larger population. And um, we think that, yes, while tropical milkweed can lower the severity of OE infections for individual butterflies. Um, this, actually could out, this actually could cause um, in, infected monarchs to live longer lifespans and would give them a longer time to transmit the parasite. So we know that it does not cure monarchs, but it might help them um, fight off the disease to some small degree. Um, but in areas where tropical milkweeds grow year-round, we think these medicinal effects will be outweighed by the high risk of infection and um, that most monarchs will become sick. So now I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Anya Mijewska, who's a PhD candidate. And she's going to talk with us about the implications of these problems for migratory monarchs, not only winter breeding ones. And she's going to discuss conservation and management. Thank you, Dara. Hello, everyone. OK, so now you've heard that tropical milkweed supports sedentary winter breeding monarchs which can then lead to high levels of disease. But does this have any broader consequences for monarch migration? This is what we're going to discuss now. And uh, here, we'll discuss implications for the eastern migratory population of monarchs that migrate to Mexico. There are several questions that have surfaced with tropical milkweed, reflecting the concerns for migratory monarchs. I, men I should mention that we don't have all the answers yet, and some of these questions are being currently investigated. All right, so first question, does tropical milkweed result in reproductive changes for migratory monarchs? Secondly, are migrants encountering these sites with tropical milkweed and sedentary monarchs, and are they mixing? Why is this important? Well, we know that sedentary populations have very high levels of disease, as Dara mentioned. But does this pose a risk to the bigger migratory population during the fall and spring migrations? We're not sure. So. Let's talk about each one of these questions. Okay, so first, um, what are the potential reproductive changes for monarchs? 
You probably know that in late summer and early fall, when monarch caterpillars and pupa experience cooler temperatures and shorter days, they then emerge in a special state, a pre-migratory state that stops the development of their reproductive organs. This is called reproductive diapause. And monarchs in this state do not mate. They do not reproduce. Instead, they save their energies to make their long-distance migration south. We also know that native milkweeds that start to age and slowly yellow in the fall also play an important role in helping monarchs enter this reproductive diapause. And so since tropical milkweed stays green and continues to flower through the fall, uh, we don't know whether it might actually discourage monarchs from entering this reproductive diapause state. And so uh, we don't know the answer yet, and this is actually something I'm going to be investigating this upcoming fall. Also, we became concerned that mo when monarchs uh, pass through these areas of tropical milkweed, that they may be stopping at these sites and breaking their reproductive diapause. In other words, mating. Effectively abandoning their migration to uh, reproduce and to lay eggs. And to answer this question, we conducted an experiment. So this past fall, 2015, with the help of citizen scientists, we collected migratory monarchs from various sites uh, in the US, including Ohio, New Jersey, Texas, and Oklahoma. And we placed them in, them in these large outdoor cages with potted tropical milkweed. For comparison, monarchs were also placed in other cages with greenhouse-grown native milkweeds and in cages with no milkweed. I need to mention that because the native milkweed plants were grown in a greenhouse, we tricked them to grow as if it was middle of the summer. So these plants were lush green with new leaves and not like the plants you would find in the wild that time of year, which would be aged and then starting to enter uh, dormancy and potentially starting to turn yellow. And so this experiment tested if migratory monarchs were more likely to break diapause in the presence of tropical milkweed as compared to the native milkweed and no milkweed at all. And so each day uh, during 10 day period, we inspected uh, the cages and counted the number of adults that mated. And each adult was individually marked so we were able to track them. And so this told us if they were breaking diapause. So I'm gonna tell you the results of this study in short, we found that some proportion of monarchs broke diapause in all cages, which was somewhat surprising, um, but the proportions were similar in all cages. And so we found no strong evidence that tropical milkweed caused migratory monarchs to break diapause, or that it would cause more monarchs to break diapause than native milkweed that has fresh new leaves. And so interestingly, if native milkweed were in this really good condition as tropical milkweed, and monarchs might be using them for reproduction. I want to mention that this is not the first time that someone performed an experiment like this. In 2007, Griba Batalden um, did a similar experiment, a somewhat different design, a more milkweed species, but uh, she also found um, that some monarchs broke, uh, broke diapause in cages with tropical milkweed, and some uh, monarchs broke diapause in a cage with native milkweeds, um, and so uh, she didn't find very strong evidence either, but she uh, had a slightly different result where she had no matings or breaking diapause in her control cage where there was no milkweed available. So long story short, uh, not a lot of strong evidence uh, for tropical milkweed causing uh, monarchs to break diapause during migration. Okay, so let's move on to the idea that migratory monarchs could be mixing with these sedentary monarch populations. And um, this is particularly important for areas like Texas where there could be a lot of mixing happening during migration. And the extent of this uh, mixing uh, is important. I'm gonna just jump right into what we know, of the results of our recent investigation and that there is mixing happening during the fall the extent is still under investigation, and um, one of the main reasons why we're so interested in this mixing is because of the risk for monarchs uh, to acquire this parasite that we talked about previously. 
So given these high levels of disease in sedentary populations, really begs the question of the chances of, of healthy migratory monarchs to acquire spores at these sites. Uh, we don't have a clear answer here yet, but we do know that when an infected individual mates with a healthy individual, that healthy adults can pick up spores as a result of a mating event, and that then these spores can be transmitted to the offspring. Also, during spring migration, there is a probability that if a healthy female is flying through one of these patches with tropical milkweed that has already built up of, of these spores on the plant, that there is a risk for her offspring of becoming infected with OE. And we know that there is a buildup of spores and tropical milkweed over time, and that these spores can survive on plants for quite a long time. OK, so let's summarize our presentation. But before we go into that, I want to mention that citizen scientists played a critical role to most of the finding, findings you heard about today. Citizen scientists alerted us to the problem they were observing in their backyards and in their garden and prompted us to do scientific studies. We should mention we're not trying to blame gardeners for high uh, disease levels in monarchs. And uh, we know that people are trying to do the right thing by planting milkweed to help monarchs. And so uh, we're not trying to place blame anywhere. Um, we do want to give huge thanks to our citizen scientists that have spent countless hours collecting data. Again, these findings would not be possible without you. OK, so summary. Tropical milkweed is easy to grow and attractive plant from the tropics. It lacks seasonality that we observe in the native plant. It's associated with winter breeding and even year-round breeding in mild climates. It is also associated with high disease risk at these winter breeding sites with sedentary monarchs. We don't have very strong evidence that it causes migratory monarchs to break diapause. And there is mixing of migratory monarchs with sedentary populations. And finally, we do know that infected sedentary monarchs are uh, most likely or, yes, uh, transmitting disease to migrants in the fall and in the spring. Next, I'm going to talk about management recommendations. And uh, I have to mention uh, that these recommendations do not apply for southern Florida, where a distinct non-migratory population has been present for decades. OK, so everywhere else but southern Florida, uh, we recommend to replace tropical milkweed with native milkweed. You can visit plantmilkweed.org, where there is a lot of great information available. There's also a fact sheet that Monarch Joint Venture has on the website that lists several native milkweeds for different regions of the country and for different soil types. If you're currently unable to replace tropical milkweed with a native milkweed, then there's a less ideal solution, and that is to cut the milkweed before migratory monarchs pass through your region and to keep it cut back all winter. And this is particularly important for areas where large quantities of monarchs pass through fall and spring. And so this also means cutting it back monthly to keep it seasonal. And again, this does not apply for southern Florida. I wanted to give you a fair warning with cutting uh, milkweed back is that you might find yourself in an uncomfortable situation of cutting tropical milkweed when it still has eggs or caterpillars. And so replacing tropical milkweed with native milkweed is uh, better. OK, so there's also other ways to support monarch conservation other than planting milkweed. And so I just have li a few listed here. And one is to plant a um, mix of nectar-rich flowers that bloom all season. And this can um, help monarchs during their migration. Also, you can become a citizen scientist. Here I have just a few uh, programs listed, monarch larva monitoring program, Monarch Health, which we talked about briefly before, Touring North, and there are more programs as well. 
Alternatively, you can support or participate in a larger scale habitat restoration project and uh, supporting sustainable food choices, local and organic, and non-GMO. If you're interested in additional information, uh, Monarch Joint Venture website uh, has a another fact sheet about tropical milkweed and the parasite we discussed. And, and you can find that through the website resources and downloads. And there's also a Q&A about the research related to tropical milkweed and the parasite. And so finally, again, I want to give huge thanks to our citizen scientists for all the help with the data collection. And we want to thank our sponsors, Monarch Joint Venture, and all of uh, the ones listed here. Thank you very much. All right. Um, that was just great, Sonia, Anya, and Dara. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise about monarch tropical milkweed and Ophiocystis selectospira with us today. Um, we have several questions that have come in, but before we get to those questions, I have just a few housekeeping announcements for the participants. Um, like all of our webinars, this webinar has been recorded and within a couple weeks will be available on the Monarch Joint Venture and NCTC websites. So we really encourage you to use this and other webinars um, for any, any uses you'd like to put them to. Um, we'll have another webinar coming up in the fall. Um, you'll receive details on this as soon as they're available. Um, so we encourage you to register and spread the word about these. And if you have suggestions for topics that we haven't covered that you'd like us to cover in a webinar, um, we'd really appreciate your suggestions and your participation in these webinars. And finally, we're going to follow up after today's webinar for everyone who registered with a short survey. Um, and we would love for you to complete the survey and share any feedback um, that you have for us. So we're going to start the question and answer period now. Um, if we go over the allotted time, this is great. We have about 15 minutes for these questions, but feel free to step out um, if you need to. Um, and I apologize in advance. We might not be able to get to all of your questions, but we'll get to as many as, you, as we can. Okay. Um, so the first one, we have actually um, somebody emailed to me, um, and that is even if tropical milkweed is producing some diseased monarchs, aren't diseased monarchs better than nothing at all if people have trouble finding or growing other species of milkweed in their gardens? Oh, so can you hear me? This is Sonia. I can hear you, so that probably means everyone can. OK, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think, for, I guess, first of all, what I would say is that um, if we want to plant tropical milkweed, then I just think it's important that we understand the consequences of that. And that, yes, it'll probably support monarchs. But in certain places, especially in the southern US, it will support high levels of disease. And so I guess one question I would have for people is if if that's what you want, is to support monarchs even though they are harboring high burdens of disease. And I just think it's important that you know we educate people um, to understand the consequences that that's probably going to happen. So I, you know, it's hard for us as scientists to tell people, this is what you have to do, or do this, don't do that. We really just first and foremost want to educate people on the scientific evidence so that they can make informed decisions. Um, that being said, I think the one thing that I am really concerned about in terms of supporting um, local populations of heavily diseased monarchs is whether that might have any consequences for disease risk for the larger migratory population, which we know passes through a lot of these places where monarchs are breeding year-round. Um, during the spring and the fall migrations, when the fall monarchs are passing through the southern U.S. and Texas, on their way to Mexico, and in the spring, they're coming back north up through these areas again. Um, and as Dara and Anya mentioned, we're currently studying the extent to which migratory monarchs are mixing with these heavily infected patches of winter breeding monarchs during these migratory periods and the extent to which that can lead to spillover to disease risk for the migratory population. So it's possible that this could elevate disease risk 
um, a, at a much broader scale than what would be supported in these local patches. And so I think, so my, my thinking is that it's not, um, it's not something that I think we should be promoting. Uh, but you know, again, I think it's just important that people understand the consequences and, and how they relate to what, you know, especially um, what geographic area we're talking about in terms of planting that milkweed. Yeah, so that's actually a really great point that you ended with there, Sonia. And that was a question that another listener had. Um, somebody wondered, in, in, in the northern United States, there are other areas that, that don't have mild winters. Are there any risks to planting tropical milkweed since it will die off by midfall, or, or is it just mm -hmm. safe for us up in Minnesota and Wisconsin and Michigan to plant it? Um, that's an interesting question, and I'll, um, I'll, I'll chime in with what I think is uh, um, an answer. So for, for Darren and Anya, who, can't, who are here because I'm, I'm not on speakerphone, the question was about um, whether there are risks of planting tropical milkweed further north um, in areas where it's going to die back during the, the fall and winter anyway. And um, I think that, so, so again, that's, that's not a question that I think we really know we have a good answer for right now. Um, Based on the current evidence, we think the risks are higher um, of planting tropical milkweed in the southern U.S. in terms of promoting high levels of disease. Um, in more northern areas, the milkweed's going to get hit by a hard frost, and so maybe the biggest risks would be that um, monarchs during the migration, some of them would be enticed to lay eggs on that milkweed, and those caterpillars are going to get hit by a hard frost when it comes. And so maybe if there's a very long, mild fall, the monarchs will be able to complete their development to adulthood and try to, to join up in the fall migration. But we just don't know what's going to happen to those eggs that are laid late season on tropical milkweed further north. So I think right now that would be the most obvious problem that I could see. But we, we think right now, because it behaves more like an annual plant further north, that, that, um, that the risks of planting it further north or the, the issues associated with it are not as high as they are with planting. Okay, thanks for that. Um, let's, we have so many questions here. So here's one that's kind of interesting. Um, so what do you think about the argument that having a subset of the population forego their migration to Mexico, um, even if that's encouraged by planting a non-native milkweed, and the argument that, that that kind of stopping and breeding in the United States might provide sort of a population-wide bet hedging strategy that could allow monarchs in general to survive changing climates in Mexico? Sure. So I'll try to address that question a little bit. This is Dara Satterfield. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about partial migration, which is common in a lot of animal populations. And that's where some part of the population migrates, and some part of the population is sedentary and does not migrate. So we do see this as sort of a bet hedging strategy, as you're describing in a lot of animals. Um, but we haven't traditionally seen that um, in monarchs in North America that we know of um, until more recently in the past few decades. So I guess what we might be observing here is, um, except for the South Florida monarchs, a shift in their migratory pattern. And this isn't happening just in monarchs, but also in um, bird and bat and ungulate populations where animals are becoming more sedentary and less migratory. And um, maybe it is, it is a strategy that animals are using to adapt to a really human-dominated landscape. Um, but we don't know yet, in most cases, what the consequences for infectious disease, ecology, or for um, health of these populations. So I think it's a great question. It's a great ecological question um, that we're still investigating and one that we have to um, monitor and one that I, as a disease ecologist, have some concerns about, and as we can see with the monarchs that are becoming more sedentary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really an interesting point. I often think that we're kind of conducting a big, giant experiment with a sample size of one, um, which makes science kind of difficult. Um, OK, so we can move on to some other. People had a lot of kind of practical questions. Um, Somebody asked, do you recommend that we try to get the word out to not use tropical plants that are purchased from Home Depot or Lowe's or Walmart? Um, is there evident, any evidence that plants that are grown to be ornamental plants are less suitable for monarchs than plants that are, are not 
read for generations. That's a, we're, we're all we're all wondering. That's an interesting question. We're not sure we have a good answer for it. Do you, maybe Anya wants to take a stab at addressing that question because she's been thinking about um, planted gardens and pollinator conservation. Okay. Sure. Hello. So this is Anya. Um, in terms of uh, so the question is if we should be discouraging people to uh, purchase. Um, Milkweed plants in general uh, from, yeah. from from places that maybe have been breeding them for many generations to be ornamental. And is there evidence that to. these more ornamental plants are less suitable for monarchs? Right. Um, so for, for monarchs, I don't know the, the answer. I know that there's been some recent work done with other pollinators and looking at ornamental plants. And uh, the preliminary results from uh, that work indicates that the more we sort of mess with plants, the more, more that they become um, cultivated and, and changed genetically and so on, that the less useful they become to pollinators. And so the more wild types tend to, to be um, more optimal as opposed to the ones that are highly um, altered after many, many generations. Um, so, um, you know, overall, um, I think that we're sending the message uh, to to not uh, plant uh, tropical milkweed for monarchs, particularly in the southeast where it could become a problem. Um, whether th the issue is that they've been bred for so many generations by, uh, you know, Home Depot, Lowe's, and so on, th that I don't know the answer to. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any research on that in terms of herbivores. I know there's research on on the flowers, but I, that, that is a really interesting question. Um, okay, so here's another one kind of changing directions here. Um, is there any evidence that monarchs will become immune to OE if they experience high levels of infection? And this participant was especially asking about the West Coast butterflies, which have historically had higher levels of OE. So that's um, that's a very insightful question, and I think that the evidence to date suggests that, in fact, some monarchs are more resistant to the OE, to, to OE than other monarchs. But there's um, the interactions between monarchs and the OE protozoan are extremely complex genetically, and when we observe resistance, resistant monarch strains to OE, what's very interesting is that the monarch, the resistant monarch genotypes are not uniformly resistant to all of the many different OE genotype strains. So OE is a very genetically diverse pathogen. There are many different strains that differ in their infectivity and their virulence towards monarchs. And what we have found is that there's no one monarch genotype that's able to resist all of the diverse OE strains. And there's a, a lot of what we call genotype specificity or strain specificity between monarch genotypes and the OE genotypes. And so what that means is that it would be very hard for monarchs to evolve um, very high levels of resistance to OE at the population level because any monarch that's resistant to one strain of OE is going to be susceptible, very susceptible to other strains of OE. Um, and so that, that's something that um, actually happens in, in many different host pathogen interactions, it's not unique to monarchs, and it might be a way, um, a strategy of the pathogens to slowing down the evolution of host resistance. So right now we do not think that monarchs um, on a wide scale are capable of evolving um, a very high levels of resistance to the pathogens. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that's perfect. That's really interesting. And um, for the questioner, um, I don't have the names of people asking the questions, but um, whoever asked that really great question, I'm, I'm sure um, Sonia or one of her students would be able to cor would be happy to correspond with you more about it. Um, okay, so here are some questions about cutting back milkweed. Um, there are quite a few questions, and I'm going to combine some into one here. So, um, if we have a warm winter and native milkweed is surviving along with the tropical milkweed, should people cut all of the milkweed back, even the native one, to spread, to help prevent the spread of OE? And then um, also, if people do cut down their milkweed, is there any evidence that the OE spores can survive in the soil once the milkweed has been cut back? 
So I'll speak briefly, this is Dara again, about um, native milkweeds. It's true that some native milkweeds will grow a little bit later in the winter, and this, oc this occurs especially in coastal California, where Asclepias vesicularis has been noted to grow even into December. Um, but it will die back eventually, um, usually in January or something like that. Um, so I don't know right now that we have recommendations about cutting back native milkweeds. Um, for the most part, we think that um, in the large majority of cases, native milkweeds are going to die back on their own. There's a few cases, as I mentioned, with vesicularis or something else that will grow a little later, but um, eventually will uh, succumb to the cold as well. So we're not as concerned about that happening. Um, now, I should mention that there's a, there's a caveat to that, and that's that if there's a neighboring yard with tropical milkweed um, and it's contaminating um, other areas with native milkweeds, we have seen cases of that um, occurring. So um, in any case, I guess, where you see very high levels of disease, um, you could occasionally cut back your milkweed um, if you think there's a contamination problem. But as of right now, we don't have any um, seasonal recommendations for cutting native species. Okay, and how about the survival of the OE spores in the soil? Yes, um, so we don't think that, um, that OE spores in the soil would be a problem. Um, if, even if they survived for a little while longer, they wouldn't likely end back up on a milkweed that re-sprouts in the spring. Okay, and here's a really quick one, and then hopefully there will be time for one. There, there are others, but there's a really fun one that just came in. But here's a quick one. Um, when can people order OE testing kits from Monarch Health? Anytime. Anytime. Good. Yay. Today. <laughs> okay. So here's one. I'm going to leave you with a really hard one here. Um, so you have shown in many studies that OE does have effects on individuals, individual monarchs, as do a lot of other things. But do you think there that have you or has anyone else been able to document uh, a measurable effect on population trends? Uh, this is Sonia. I'll answer that question. We, um, we, we, that's a hard thing to measure out in the field, but we've done some, I guess what we call simulation modeling, some computational approaches to try to ask what would the impact be at the population level given what we know about the impact of OE on individual level survival and reproduction. And what we think is that in places where OE reaches very high prevalence, so between 70 and 100 percent, that there's roughly 60 percent uh, fewer monarchs there than there would be if OE was absent. So in other words, it's, um, it's reducing, it's, it's not causing monarchs to disappear from an area but their abundance is about 60% lower than it would be, would, would have been without OE. So what we don't know is, uh, and then we've also looked at sort of when, when OE prevalence is much lower, again, there are, there are population level effects. Again, looking, exploring that with some mathematical models and computational approaches. Um, but we, we don't know whether that is borne out by evidence in the field, because I think that would be a very challenging thing to study. What we'd almost have to do um, is, that, is find a way to experimentally remove OE from affected populations, and I'm not sure right now how we would accomplish that. So we'd have to remove OE and, from affected populations in the wild and then look at what happens to the monarch numbers if they go up or not. Um, but, but, so the best we can do, I think, right now is through these, these computational approaches, which suggest that it does have an effect at the population level. It's not driving monarchs extinct, but um, I, I think that, that it's definitely a measurable effect. Okay, great. So it is 2 o'clock right now, and that was the time. Um, I think that we should quit, and I apologize to people whose questions came in later. Um, this was obviously a hugely interesting topic um, for all of our audience. So um, I just want to thank Sonia and Dara and Anya. You guys were amazing. Um, this was a really great presentation. Um, like I said before, it will be archived and available to people. Um, we'd like to thank the NCTC for hosting this and all of the other Monarch Joint Venture Monarch webinars that we've put on. And especially to everyone who's out there, we had um, almost 200 different computers and probably more than that numbers of people listening. Um, so we hope you come back um, for our next webinars. Thanks to everyone. <laughs>
Bye-bye.